with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, May 12th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Amia Srinivasan, professor of social and political theory at the University of Oxford and author of The Right to Sex, Feminism in the 21st Century. And later in the show, Melanie DiRigo, candidate for Congress in New York's third district on Long Island, Long Island. That second attempt was an accent, I, or I tried it. Strong Island. Yeah. Hell yeah. In a surprise to no one, Joe Manchin joined every Republican in voting against a bill to enshrine Roe v. Wade into law. 49 in favor, 51 opposed. Not even coming close. The 60-vote threshold needed due to the filibuster. I'm so glad the Democrats have a plan B, though, right? In California, Governor Gavin Newsom is proposing adding tens of millions more to the budget to account for an influx of out-of-state patients seeking abortions in the state. More blue states are trying to fortify their abortion protections as well. In the occupied West Bank, Palestinians are holding a state funeral for the journalist shot dead by Israeli forces, Shireen Abu Akleh. Some Democratic lawmakers have spoken out about the killing, but pro-Palestinian activists are calling for an independent investigation outside of the Israeli one, which is certainly not going to come up with a fair judgment here. Today, Finland's president and prime minister stated their support for their country joining NATO, signaling the end of a decades-long neutral status. Finland shares a border with Russia. In Florida, families of the victims of the Surfside condo collapse have reached a nearly $1 billion settlement. New data shows that overdose deaths primarily involving fentanyl and meth increased by 15% in 2021. Overdose deaths increased by 30% in the year before. The initial findings of an investigation conducted by the Interior Department have been released. Deb Holland looked into the brutality faced by indigenous children at hundreds of boarding schools run by the U.S. government and have found, thus far, over 500 deaths of indigenous children. And the report warns that more will come. And lastly, the American Prospect is reporting that Biden's Director of Domestic Policy Council, Susan Rice, the Domestic Policy Council, has presided over a hostile work environment that includes berating Health and Human Services Secretary Xavier Becerra, as well as her subordinates. Yikes. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. It's an Emma Jordy Report Thursday. Every day has got to have a got to have a special uh I don't know branding. A little tag, yeah. Yeah, we still have. We're still working on the the Monday, the Monday one. But thirsty, we're all off... thirsty Thursday. Thirsty Thursday. Well, I that's mean... what it was for college and me. <laughs> that's what we called Thursday. Did, that... it, was that Thirsty Thursday out on the East Coast too? Yeah, I think it was like the Thursday was the the day when it was like that's when parties begin for the weekend. I remember when I started scheduling to not have class on Friday, and it felt like I had like found a back door into heaven <laughs> yeah right um it, it's like this huge sigh of relief when you get past freshman year and you realize oh all my classes don't have to be at 9 a.m like i can even put the start at one i can start my day at one 
I used to be able to so easily sleep till like 11 a.m. We've talked about this, Matt. You can still do that. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. On some weekends, I'm, I go well past noon. Bradley, you can do that too. Oh, I sleep till I sleep till 12:30 at least on the weekends. Absolutely. I miss. I, I also I, skipped class all the time in college. Like I, I very rarely went. Oh well, I, I would go if I was hungover. Sometimes I'd go with a little uh, buzz, aka you know some weed would help me out um but that's because i was a degenerate no longer now i can't even sleep past 10 o'clock i wish um but in in darker news let's turn back to what's dominated the news cycle which is this roe v wade uh leaked opinion it's likely gonna stay that way seems like the supreme court justices the conservatives that were maybe wavering a little bit are still going to vote to overturn Roe and not in the more tailored way that Roberts would prefer, which is really just a, a, a part of his branding at this point. I mean, if it came down to it, I think Roberts would join them. He's just he's he's the third wheel or he's the uh, the sixth wheel. Yeah, I mean, it, it suits him to be seen dragged kicking and screaming into all this. Right. And frankly, it's not too dissimilar from the way Susan Collins brands herself, or really the way Joe Manchin tries to brand himself. Functionally, I mean, it's kind of the inverse, but functionally it's the same thing. Joe Manchin was the lone Democrat to vote against the Roe v. Wade codification bill yesterday in the Senate. Here's Joe Manchin explaining ahead of his vote why he was going to vote no on uh, the Roe v. Wade bill. It is just absolutely unconscionable, but predictable. The bill we have today to vote on, the Women's Health Protection Act, and I respect people who support, but don't make no mistake, it is not Roe v. Wade codification. It's an expansion. It wipes 500, 500 state laws off the books. It expands abortion. And with that, that's not where we are today. We should not be dividing this country further than we're already divided. And it's it's really the, the, the politics of Congress that's dividing the country. It's not the people. They, they're telling us what they want. And uh, it's just disappointing that uh, we're going to be voting on a piece of legislation, which I will not vote for today. I mean, just like the primary driving force behind uh, his his political ideology is just like the perception of divisiveness can you imagine being that shallow when really he's just a firewall yeah. for for the right wing so um ensuring that even small amounts of progress do not happen in this country yeah what he's talking about there with those 500 laws are likely unconstitutional in my opinion laws on the books that have been creeping uh that have been uh instrumental in the right creeping towards outright bans of abortion up yeah, to it, this point it's part of the orchestrated campaign that got us here right the bills that uh, require ultrasounds so a woman has to look at her baby um even though in some of these in some of these states uh where they have six week abortion bans I, I, it's microscopic at that point in a woman's pregnancy. So there's not much to look at there, but uh, the act was designed to ban the six week uh, uh, abortion bans, the 20 week abortion bans, all of the abortion bans that uh, violated Roe v. Wade. But it, what Manchin there was objecting to was the elimination of those over 500 state and local laws that would limit abortion access, like I mentioned, the ultrasound requirements, the waiting periods where you have to read pamphlets on how you're killing your baby, essentially. Um, all, of those more, all of those things that create a burden on the woman if she wants to seek an abortion, that is what Joe Manchin is objecting to. But he hides behind... I'm against divisiveness. I'm about bringing the country Let's together. Let's leave it to the states because that's democracy, which, by the way, maybe Joe Manchin is reading Glenn Greenwald lately because that's the uh, <laughs> uh, argument he's been making. Right. So uh, uh, when you leave it to the states, those are the, kind, uh, those are the kinds of bills that he is protecting. Those are the kinds of laws that he is protecting. It's not about some sort of principle. Yeah. The, it is about he is protecting the state's right to make a woman feel shamed 
for her abortion. And we mentioned this yesterday, Sam did, and I mentioned it last night on Left Reckoning, um, but Montana, for instance, has the exact same sort of roast up privacy right to abortion uh, in their state constitution recognized by the Supreme Court, and the G uh, local GOP there is just going to replace all the Supreme Court members um, if they can't override it uh, constitutionally, yeah. Yeah, Montana's an interesting state, but th that's a that's a, a conversation for another day. Susan Collins, Murkowski, they proposed an alternative kind of uh, third way, if you will, abortion act to the Women's Health Protection Act. They were with Manchin and saying, oh, come on, you can't overturn states' rights and the laws that are there to make women feel uh, like they're bad people if they choose to have control over their reproductive health. Um, but it, it, it left all of the loopholes in place for more laws like that 500, uh, those 500 laws that Manchin is so con committed to upholding. Um, yeah, it, it uh, came from the same policy school that created the uh, ACA <laughs> replacement from the GOP. The, oh crap, we actually need something or else we're seen as uh, uh, awful and wanting to just get rid of uh, people's rights. So here's Bernie Sanders, uh, an example of somebody who did the right thing here talking about this bill on the Senate floor. We all knew this wasn't going to pass, but contrast his uh, emphasis with Manchin's emphasis on, I don't want divisiveness and I'm in favor of states, uh, state laws in principle, even uh, irrespective of the, the like content of those laws. Now I get very tired of hearing the hypocrisy from the extreme right wing who say, to quote, get the government off our backs. How often have we heard that? Get the government off our backs. We want small government. Well, I say to those right wingers, if you want to get the government off of the backs of the American people, and understand that it is women who control their own bodies, not politicians. During the COVID crisis, how many times have we heard on this floor throughout this country, the extreme right wing say, the government must not force us to wear a mask. How dare the government do that? Government must not force us to have a vaccine. We have the right to do what we want with our bodies. That's a hypocrisy that we have highlighted on the show before. And that is an example of somebody who's committed to justice and principles of humanity versus somebody who is committed to capital, in the case of Manchin, and also who falls back on, in service of cap serving capital, a commitment to abstract but largely meaningless principles in order to shield oneself from repercussions. States' rights is not a real principle. It's just not. Uh, women's rights, human rights, rights of bodily autom autonomy, and fighting just, back against patriarchy those are there. legitimate principles with regards to him making there's might be a few people in the audience that are see like well you've wanted to force people to get the vaccine nobody forced anybody to get the vaccine no. uh the the vaccine requirements for it were if you wanted to participate and like have people serve you then you need to make sure you're like doing as much as you can to take the virus seriously and stop the spread as much as possible um so that's like your right to make a uh, a fast food employee serve you regard with like not being vaxxed or masked like is not the same as obviously a woman's right to choose which is just to spell that out for folks a hundred percent um i mean I, I can't i don't know if i speak for you matt but i was not in, i'm not in favor of i mean look i don't know i i don't know if i would be in favor of mandating vaccinations for everybody or throwing or, or incarcerating people for that choice. I know that's kind of a straw man, um, but the, the right is in favor of if a woman chooses to, uh, to, to do what she wants with her body, well, she should probably be criminalized because that's murder. Yeah, if an pre unwanted pregnancy is terminated, then the uh, woman or at least the doctor is a criminal. Yep. 
I was in favor of, right, of compulsory, uh, compulsory uh, vaccination requirements to participate in parts of society. But also, that was a very temporary thing. Yeah, which we're a lot of those people wanted to act like it was the beginning of 1984. Yeah, and now we're just back to normal, even in liberal, socialist New York City. So, um, yep, the couldn't be a starker contrast between two senators there, Bernie Sanders and, uh, and Joe Manchin. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we are going to be joined by Amiya Srinivasan, professor of social and political theory at the University of Oxford and author of The Right to Sex, Feminism in the 21st Century. We'll be right back. We are back, and we are joined right now by Amiya Srinivasan, professor of uh, social and political theory at the University of Oxford and author of The Right to Sex, Feminism in the 21st Century. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, right off the bat, uh, before we get a bit into the book, we probably should talk a bit about the news. And I, we have almost exhausted the topic on the show over the past week, but at the same time, there's always more that can be said. Um, as a feminist writer and as a professor who's studied this for many, many years, what was your initial response when you saw that uh, breaking news? Honestly, I think it was last Monday because I remember where I was when I saw it, uh, the leaked opinion coming out of the Supreme Court uh, on Roe v. Wade. Uh, well, it was a combination of... Um instinctive and quite personal horror and i think that is recognizable to a lot of women even though i don't live in the u.s anymore um you know i have very strong ties to the u.s and i grew up partly there and it felt and it feels i think to most women to the majority of women like an intensely personal attack um the other emotion i had was horrified admiration for american conservatives they have planned this for decades, they have been strategic, um, much more, much more strategic than Democrats when it comes to thinking about um, the protection of reproductive freedom, uh, and they've won. And I feel, of course, a lot of um, anger and horror at uh, Alito, all of the conservative judges, the Supreme Court in general, which I think is a deeply flawed institution, all of the Republicans who made this happen. But I'm also very angry with all the Democrats who have allowed this to happen, since it's been so clear to anyone who's been watching for the last few decades that this has been the game plan all along. Exactly. And frankly, the fact that they've been caught flat footed is... Yeah reprehensible i'm reminded of a quote from nancy pelosi in 2017 do we have that just really briefly talking about how abortion sh is should not be a front-facing issue for democrats maybe if we just have the headline there um we can pull that up but uh sorry for springing that on you guys but you know that the the fact that they seemingly have zero plan b yesterday mm -hmm. the roe v wade codification bill predictably failed in a Senate that is not going to carve out a filibuster exemption for women's reproductive health and just their human humanity, human rights. Um, the, the, uh, if you, yeah, uh, Nancy Pelosi said this in 2017, which is just, which is just shocking. I mean, frankly, Pelosi said democratic candidates should not be forced to tow party line on abortion. Um, she said it was quote fading 
as an issue for Democrats. That was in 2017. Now here we are five years here later. Yeah, I mean, it's like Democratic candidates shouldn't have to toe the line on respecting women's bodily autonomy with resisting the onslaught against against women, against trans people, against queer people, against poor people, uh, predominantly poor people of color, immigrants. These are all of the people whom this will affect. And I mean, part of what I object to so much on Pelosi's line is the thought that well, you know, everyone keeps their own moral counsel about abortion. And I actually think that's pretty right. I think that people have the right to have, you know, a view on what may be a fairly complicated moral issue on the question of, you know, uh, on the question of whether one oneself would ha get an abortion. Of course, one never really knows until one is in those circumstances. The political question here, the legal question here is a different question. Right. Here's the tragedy behind this is that abortions don't go down when it is criminalized. More women just die. Right. And that's what conservatives in this country, I'm sorry to say, want. I mean, you know, what this is about is not simply about the control of women's bodily autonomy, although it is. It's also about penalizing any woman who wants to have non reproductive sex who wants to have sex for any reason apart from serving the patriarchal reproductive order, producing new bodies for the next generation. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, we're seeing, I mean, frankly, the there's the, one of the uh, dominating principles on the right is the commitment to punishment. And uh, they want to punish trans people for existing. And they also want to punish women if they have sex outside of marriage, uh, if they decide to take that into their own hands. I mean, it's no coincidence that we're now seeing discussion of perhaps we should ban IUDs in the morning after mm -hmm. pill. The, rep the, uh, the contraceptive that women have the most control over individually. A man might be able to see if you're taking birth control every day. I mean, although they'll come to that next, uh, the birth control pill, I should say, condoms, et cetera. The man has more control over that. But the ones that a woman has control over, in, 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 that she has agency over, that's what they're going to target next, obviously. Obviously, and it's so interesting, of course, because those are the two forms of contraception that were really at issue in the Hobby Lobby case, mm -hmm. right? We're, which was one of the important building blocks to get us to precisely where we are today. But the horizon here isn't just abortion, right? It's about every right, constitutionally guaranteed right that the left and progressives have fought for, which have not been recognized for the long durée of American history, right? The right to desegregated, racially desegregated schools, the right to gay marriage, the right to contraception. Um, these. If you look at Alito's reasoning, if one can call it that in the majority, what will be the majority opinion, one finds that it will just apply easily to all of those constitutionally or what we should think of as constitutionally guaranteed rights. That's the long game here. It's reversing reversing all of that, taking us back many decades. 100%. And I, I will get off this in a second, but just to return to, to Pelosi's statement there, what else is an organizing principle for Democrats if it's not <laughs> protecting a woman's right to choose? Because frankly, uh, leadership at least is not committed to really any uh, broad economic policy set like Medicare for all or a Green New Deal. That's only the progressive wing. So what else do they stand for, frankly? And they still are allowing uh, someone in their tent named Henry Cuellar and campaigning for him, frankly, who is an anti-choice Democrat. So it's it's a depressing time, and it's a good time to have you on uh, to discuss these these issues uh, fairly broadly. Because, you know, you make a a point at the start of your book, and and you emphasize it: feminism is political, and thus sex is is political in and of itself. Um, broad overview: Why did you feel it was necessary to make to emphasize that um, in in a work of of feminist theory and this collection mm -hmm. of essays, which I'd encourage everybody to check out your book. It's really excellent. Um, to me, that seems obvious, but I think to a lot of people, it's not. Yeah, I think to a lot of people, it isn't. And I'm, I'm glad it strikes you as um, 
obvious. And what I want is once you point it out, it should be obvious to people, right? So people tend to instinctively think as sex as just something that happens in the private sphere, um, in the home, which they also think of as not a place of politics, right? Politics is what happens at, um, you know, in the Senate chamber or at the voting booth. Uh, and the home, meanwhile, is something that just needs to be protected from political inquisition. This is the very traditional understanding of the home, of married life, of sex, of the family. But of course, all of these things I've just mentioned, as the abortion debate shows so clearly, are actually central to the current political configuration, right? I mean, conservatives have a very strong interest in the family taking a particular form, in mm -hmm. sex taking a particular form. Um, I mean, just to connect the family to something that is a little less obvious to some people, when you think about debt, and the way that debt, privatized debt, operates in the US, it couldn't operate the way it does if it weren't for the family. Because you need parents to back those huge loans that children need to take out, young people need to take out to go to university. And you need the fear of your family being inundated with debt to get you to pay it back, right? So the family operates as this, uh, this central important mechanism, even under uh, you know, what we call a neoliberalized economic vision, a vision which is supposed to be all about individuals, but actually is very often about the family. Um, well, so, I mean, the yeah. uh, sorry, to, the, you get a tax break if you're married. That's another I, way that the family is political, right? And, and, and if now gay couples, it's very likely, given the extremist Supreme Court, they could be excluded from that. That's a way that politics shapes family in a very direct way. Absolutely. And so, and, you know, so all of these things need to be exposed as not merely personal. I'm not saying that people don't have strong personal investments, and I'm certainly not saying that they should just be subject to state inquisition and regulation. But we need to, as you were already saying, recognize that these are already political things, right? The way the family operates, what forms of sex are allowed and not allowed, these are all kinds of political decisions that are being made, and we need to be making much more actively. So you, you write in your book about how uh, you, you look at some of these issues through a perspective of an older feminist mm -hmm. lens that is not afraid to look at sex as political. In terms of feminist theory, when did the sh that shift happen when sex was viewed, at least in mainstream feminist theory, um, as 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 outside of the political sphere because you would think that you know feminist thinkers and i know there's a range of them if you're intersectional or if you're a white feminist right and i the latter of which i'm i'm, I'm quite critical of the, on this program um you would think that 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 would still be at the forefront but um what is the history of that how did that kind of get obscured so i'll stick to the american uh case because i think it's what um your viewers will be most familiar with, and it's a really good test case for this. So, you know, in the late 60s and 1970s, as the women's liberation movement is taking taking place um, in the US, you have this repoliticization of all sorts of things that have been understood previously to just be private. Sex, abortion, contraception, the structure of the family, childcare, healthcare, education. And then what starts happening, however, for, for really good reason, um, is that by the time we get to the 90s, there's a kind of pushback against thinking of at least some aspects of sex as political. And people increasingly want to say, feminists increasingly want to say, no, look, you shouldn't actually subject the kind of sex people are having to political critique, so long as it's consensual, right? And so the kind of critique that earlier feminists wanted to offer, what they would say, look at the kind of sex that people are having. This isn't genuinely free sex. This is sex that's actually shaped by patriarchal expectations, according to which men are going to be in every way dominant and women are there to submissively serve men's pleasure. Uh, that's itself a political construct. Feminists want, increasingly in the 80s and 90s, wanted to back away from that and wanted just to insist that, no, actually, as long as it's consensual, it's fine. Now, as I said, that's for some some good reasons, right? 
there are dangers in subjecting sex to a kind of political critique and telling people that they shouldn't be having certain forms of sex, even if they're consensual, right? I mean, think, I mean, that's what conservatives do all of the time, right? They tell people they shouldn't be having consensual gay sex, or they shouldn't mm. be having consensual norm, non-normative sex or se consensual sex outside of the family or outside of marriage. Um, and so some feminists started to feel that this kind of anti-sex um, feminism was authoritarian, right? It was trying to control women in kind of the same way that um, men had historically controlled women. So there was a kind of backlash against it. And we got the embrace of what's called sex positivity, right? A form of feminism that is supposed to be actively um, embracing all sorts of different forms of sex as long as they are consensual. But one of the things that's that I think has happened, and it's you can really see this by talking to like young women now, college age women, high school age women, is that sex positivity, which was supposed to be a liberating doctrine, has ended up making a lot of women feel pressured to just have a lot of sex on men's terms. So it ends up not really feeling freeing to them. So there's a kind of complicated dialectic here, but what you see is throughout this history, women trying to articulate what sexual freedom really means or might really involve. And what would it mean to have sex outside of a script that's just written by men? So is part of that too, just if feminist theory or sex positivity, I should say, and that concept, if it, it excludes itself from politics to to that degree um or you're just you know all con sex is you know if it's consensual it's fine right and you make a kind of broad strokes argument about that one i think it obviously needs to be updated to include trans people include uh, non-binary people etc but two um it, you're kind of ceding the sexual political space to the right and they when when you cede territory to them they seize everything that they can, right? Mm -hmm. And you exit the political space to a degree. They fill that vacuum very easily. They're a minoritarian uh, ideology, honestly, as particularly in the United States. And, and th th that's kind of inherent to how they, they seize power right now. So is that part of the fear as well? Mm -hmm. That's such an interesting analysis. And to me, it makes really good sense of the incel phenomenon. Um, and which I do talk I about. I want to get into bit, that too. Which I yeah. Talk about, yeah. Right. So, because I think what you're saying is right. So, you have a one hand, a kind of mainstream left understanding of sex where as long as it's consensual, it's fine. So, basically, it's a, it's a market ideology, right? So, long as Amazon worker has contracted to be screwed over in, in, um, in the warehouse, then uh, what Jeff Bezos is doing is permissible. And so you have a similar kind of market logic within sex. As long as it's consensual, it's fine. Intuitively, a lot of people chafe at this, right? Because you, you, you look at what actually happens in sex and you think, but, you know, there, there are weird hierarchies here. For example, there are racial hierarchies, hierarchies that say that people of certain races are more sexually desirable or have higher sexual status than other people. And I think one thing, and what happens is that there's a right-wing narrative that very easily steps in into that gap. You see it from someone like Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. who offers you, um, young, offers a young, dissatisfied sort of, man, um, typically, a diagnosis, right? And it's always a return to a mythical traditional time when um, everyone was sexually satisfied because we had marriage. And that meant that, you know, no one had to sort of, no man had to go without sexually. Of course, whether this served women or not is kind of beside the point. But I think you're right that it's a sort of failure of the left because actually, feminists are well positioned in a sense to speak to incels at least before they've gone totally radicalized because feminists can say to incels you're right that a lot of the ways that the sexual marketplace works the fact that it is a marketplace and it's seen as a place of trading status that's messed up that's not a really sexually free um realm but the ideology you're being pulled towards by someone like peterson is the equivalent of you know, 
a tradition, a member of the so-called traditional white working class, uh, you know, blaming immigrants or people of color for their objectively immiserated situation, rather than identifying the true culprit, which is, you know, the capitalist oppressor, to put it, you know, bluntly. That's an incredible argument. I mean, the the extrapolation of neoliberal ideology onto like uh, sex, uh, sexuality. I've never ever thought of it that way. But it it, it that the, the, they're they're mirroring alienation. Mm -hmm. That's mirroring uh, that kind of alienation that's driving people towards, you know, uh, as you say, um, demonizing ethnic groups uh on the political stage but you know in in terms of the incel community g g demonizing women and, and and um looking for outside sources and groups for feelings of of loss or listlessness or inability to connect in a society that makes it very hostile yeah absolutely and i think in both cases what you also have is on one hand a kind of justified um, grievance at real phenomena, and then an unjustified grievance at the perception of a thwarted entitlement, right? So there's, on one hand, I mean, members of the so-called traditional white working class have very strong reason to be angry in the U.S. about just the state of economic inequality, right? Um, but they incorrectly think that what is happening is that my you know racial minorities are doing better than they are which objectively is just false right and there's something similar going on i think in the case of incels they they um have a kind of justified grievance about you know this sexuality and sex treated as this kind of um status conferring commodity but they but instead of but what they're really upset about is the fact that they're not getting what they think that they're entitled to, rather than offering a fundamental critique of the entire system. A hundred percent. And I, I want to work backwards because that the chapter about incels, um, which is also the same title uh, of your book, comes after uh, you b both looking at, you know, accusations of rape, which I want to get into, but pornography you also analyze through um you know the evolution of feminist critiques of pornography and also just in your conversations with your students as well because i think this works well with what you were talking about about sex positivity and feminism in the 1970s and 80s you know we have to update it now right um because feminism in the 70s and 80s was also blanketly porn is uh, patriarchy porn is uh degrading to women it's wrong etc and i think now feminists you know, intersectional uh, not just white feminists have a have a have a positive and different view of sex work that is a market shift from that perception in uh, mm -hmm. perspective i should say from the 70s and 80s. So do you mind taking us a, a little through that mini history and that evolution as well and and how pornography can be viewed in 2022 through a feminist lens or how how you maybe you view it as well? Yeah. Um okay. It's a broad question, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so you're absolutely right that for uh, especially especially American feminists, but to a lesser extent, British and Australian feminists in the mid 1970s onward, they came to see pornography as the kind of like linchpin of patriarchy. They saw pornographic representation as the training ground for men's subjugation and abuse of women outside of pornography and outside the bedroom as well. So they, for example, drew a strong connection between sexual harassment in the workplace or unfair, unequal wages and pornography. It was a pretty implausible then as an account of what was going on because pornography then wasn't, I mean, there wasn't an internet. Uh, you, you know, you had to go into a store and go get a top shelf magazine or you had to go to a blue cd theater it just didn't have anything like the kind of ubiquitous um role that it has now so but what's but what's interesting is to revisit those debates now when 
pornography really is pretty ubiquitous and where young people do have, um, I say really ubiquitous, I think it's always important to remember that only about 50% of the world's population is online. Um, so we're never actually talking. I mean, it can, that's an important thing to remember. But um, I mean, I think arguably it's the case that young people now are much more formed by pornography than they used to be historically. I mean, certainly when I talk to my students, they feel that the script, the sexual script available to them was very much one written by porn. But I should say it's mainstream porn that they're talking about because there's a huge amount of queer, independent, feminist porn that does not recycle very narrow, boring tropes of just male domination, female submission. Um, the thing is, most of that porn isn't free. It's certainly not available on something like Pornhub. I mean, the story about 21st century pornography is a story about capitalism. It's about the domination of the internet uh, by um, basically one company that has a monopoly and that uses mostly stolen content, right, to drive its traffic, has a very powerful algorithm whose function it is to bring different people's desires into conformity with each other. So if you write threesome, you're only going to get one kind of threesome, right? There's only going to be uh, one distribution of the genders. And it's also really important to note that the existence of something like Pornhub has directly driven down um, the, the income of the women who work in porn, and it has also accelerated the rate at which they have to progress to more intensive, hardcore sex acts. Um, so when we talk about 21st century porn, I think it's very important to name what kind of pornography worries, worries us and what sort of pornography might be more promising or liberatory or emancipatory. The one thing that I think we, the one lesson we must learn from the 70s and 80s is not to try and look to the coercive power of the state to address any of these issues. Yeah. So, you know, in the feminists in the mid 1970s onwards, famous for drafting forms of legislation that uh, didn't try to criminalize porn, but did try and make it subject to civil litigation. Uh, hugely well-intentioned, really bad idea in practice. The reasoning that Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon put forward behind their ordinances was taken up wholesale by the Canadian Supreme Court, who made this decision, this very important decision called Butler, that said um, that... Uh, pornography, um, sorry, what exactly did it say? It said that uh, the uh, that ruled out, um, that, that said certain forms of pornography can't constitute criminal obscenity, okay. right? And then within a few months, what happens is Canada's first gay and lesbian bookshop, Glad Day Bookshop, is found guilty of criminal obscenity. Because that's what the state does when you give them these laws. It doesn't go after the mainstream big porn giant. It goes after the queers and the gays and, and trans people. Um, and, you know, and so whatever we think we need to do or we don't need to do about porn, reaching to the carceral state is not the answer. A hundred percent. And I, I, when you talked about how uh, you know, Pornhub steals steals content. It's like this, I guess, monopoly uh, on on um, on pornography. What is your take on OnlyFans as a uh, you know? It's a fairly recent phenomenon, and there's a response to it because uh, my understanding is that only you cannot uh, repost OnlyFans content. It is. Uh, say you're to record it and put it on another website it's you're violating their terms or potentially the law i don't really know i just this is a kind of I, i'm i'm figuring it out as i'm talking about it but um at the same time that really just applies to the company of only fans right yeah. not the individual creators so uh, that's the 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 sex workers working on only fans they are not owning the their own material, it protects OnlyFans, even though in theory it sounds like an, a, a less uh, exploitative practice uh, versus Pornhub. Yeah, so I think that's exactly the right diagnosis. So I think OnlyFans 
better on the whole than something like Pornhub, in part because sex workers, um, you know, a lot of people who would practice in-person sex work, forms of, you know, what's called prostitution, um, moved on to OnlyFans and that often, not always, is much is physically safer. Um, but of course, the problem with OnlyFans is that it's not owned by sex workers. What you want is an OnlyFans that is run by a sex workers cooperative, mm-hmm. right? But you need big servers, right? And your server can never go down. Disaster. You need a huge amount of startup capital. Who does, who, you know, and who has that kind of money available? Are sex workers, is a cooperative of sex workers going to be able to call on that startup capital? Absolutely not. Um, I shouldn't say absolutely not. I'm optimistic. Sex workers uh, and sex worker cooperatives are some of the most politically imaginative and organizationally astute um, people I've come across. And so if anyone was going to do it, I think sex workers would. So OnlyFans ambivalent and sex workers are precarious on OnlyFans, right? Think about what happened when the major credit card companies started saying that uh, sex workers had to get off. Think about forms of legislation. I mean, there's a piece of legislation in California right now moving through the legislative process, trying to get sex workers off um, OnlyFans. So there isn't fundamental security unless workers own the means of production. A hundred percent. It it was interesting too how OnlyFans, in order to um, appease their investors, were they were like, we're going to ban sex work, and then they had mm-hmm. they faced so much pressure and they had to reverse it. And uh, you just have to imagine that you would never have that issue if this was a cooperative and that it was actually owned by the workers putting in the labor um, on OnlyFans. I want to, since we're working backwards, go to your your first essay um, where we can talk about Me Too and accusations of rape. You you open talking about false accusations and then also about true ones and how power plays into that. Was that a deliberate choice by you given just, you know, how I think some people are grasping at a way to find the boundaries uh, of this conversation or the rules um, because of course false accusations of rape do happen but you have to look at how power race etc plays into that um did you did you do that on purpose to maybe bring people in who might be skeptical or uneasy about the the movement's uh rules or lack thereof yeah, it was a very deliberate decision on my part. So I actually opened the book by, or opened that chapter, which is the first chapter of the book, by um, talking about two cases that I know of that I think are plausibly cases of false rape accusations. Um, and I think my that my guiding thought here was feminism has nothing to fear from this. False accusations, of course they happen. Um, and... But it's not some trump card, right? And I think so many people want to treat it, so many men who want to talk about Me Too going too far or or the evils of feminism in general want to treat this like some sort of trump card. And it's very important, I think, that feminists have something to say about it. And there's a lot to say about it. I mean, first thing to say is that they are very, very rare. That's what all the statistics suggest. Um, All of the studies that have done that tend to over-exaggerate the rates of false accusation because they draw their data from police departments who are generally in the grip of various kinds of um, rape myths. So police departments will very often say that an allegation was false if there was no no weapon present or no evidence of a physical struggle. We, of course, know that those don't need to be present for rape to occur, usually aren't. Um, But the other thing to say is that False rape allegations, when they happen, especially in the U.S., tend to happen against men of color, and those false accusations tend to be brought by other men. And the other men they tend to be brought by are the police, right? Because the structure, the paradigm structure of the false rape allegation in the U.S. um, isn't a vengeful woman accusing a man of something he didn't do. It's an actual crime has occurred, an actual sexual assault has occurred, um, and the police coach a false witness identification or um, 
you know, just arrest someone who, you know, who is also black, but um, didn't, isn't actually the person uh, who committed the crime um, and, and induces a false confession. So that's when we're, if we're really worried about false accusation, we should be worried about um, the racialized nature of policing and the criminal justice system in the U.S. And there's less statistics on, fewer statistics on this, but, um, you know, on the whole, the prison population in the U.S. is made up of um, poor people. And uh, I would I would be shocked if it weren't the case that um, working class men and poor men were much more susceptible to false rape accusations than middle class and wealthy men. So our paradigm of who we think of as the victim of the false rape accusation is totally wrong. Well, because it's it's wealthy white men using the, that, uh, obscuring the, re the, the, the realities and the power dynamics of the paradigm that you, you, you say, um, and, and extrapolating it onto their entirely different situation in order to, fa uh, to, to uh, get away with crimes. And I, I, you write this, and I just thought it was so well said. There's no general conspiracy against men, but there is a conspiracy against certain classes of men. Mm -hmm. And 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 that is, I think that is the, the major takeaway from, that people should take away from, from the Me Too movement to be inherently, I think, to believe women, yes, and especially in in instances when it's about powerful men because mm -hmm. of all of those conditions that you describe. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, can you talk and expand a little bit more on the muscle memory that's been created um, mm -hmm. in this in, in the United States in particular? I know you, your book focuses on many different countries but we're running out of time and i wanted to touch on this point um the portrayal of black people in uh in america black, black men you you mm -hmm. touched on it before they're portrayed as rapists uh women are not to be believed if they were raped black women i should say um and how that dynamic and that long history that comes from slavery and white supremacy has been exploited and continues to be exploited in 2022. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the great Angela Davis talks about how the uh, time-worn myth of the Black rapist um, has as its double, has as its flip side, the time-worn myth of the unrapeable black woman, right? So the idea is this, this black woman who is so sexually promiscuous, so asking for it, that to have sex with her could never be a violation, right? So unrapeability here paradoxically generates uh, inc increasing uh, rape. And uh, sorry to cut you off, but we've played a clip on the show of, of Thomas Jefferson's descendants um, who cast uh, aspersions on the notion, right, Matt, that uh, uh, total denial, total denial of and mm -hmm. claiming it was consensual uh, b between Jefferson and his slaves. That's one example of it as well. But yeah, yeah. fantastic. Right. Yeah. So, and, and, and that notion of the sort of unrapability of black women is very alive. I mean, you can look at the sociological studies on this. So, um, I mean, there's this, you know, for example, young black girls are just seen as sexually promiscuous, not having any of the kind of innocence and purity of young, young white girls. Um, and, and so, for, and, and that's part of the reason why R. Kelly, right, wasn't, um, held accountable for his actions for so long, right? I mean, one of the jurors at his trial, a white juror at his trial actually says that he just didn't believe um, any of these uh, these black girls, right? These sexually promiscuous black girls that they had been um, subject to uh, sexual violence by, by R. Kelly. And the kind of tragedy of this, as you see in various cases like the R. Kelly case or the Justin Fairfax case is that this this, the white mythology about black sexuality um, has created actually a tension sometimes between black men's need to exonerate themselves and black women's need to be able to speak truly about the sexual violence that they do sometimes suffer from men of their own race. Um, and that is one of these uh, problems that, and dilemmas that something like an intersectional feminism 
helps us with or helps us at least to analyze, even if it doesn't help us, um, even if it's not obvious in the first instance what to do about it. Lastly, uh, you talk about how believe women and people who, you know, say, well, what about this case? Or, you know, the men, men can be abused too, 100%, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. 100%. Um, but the, the, when, when people say, well, don't believe women all the time, uh, they're, people are innocent until uh, uh, proven guilty, they're conflating a uh, critique of injustice historically with a legal principle. And do you mind fleshing that out a little bit so maybe people have a bit of a, uh, of a guide to navigating this conversation with somebody who might bring that up? So the pr presumption of innocence is a really important legal principle. It's a principle of legal justice, um, not just in the American legal system, but in many places around the world. And, you know, the idea is that it's, it's worse to um, let a guilty person go free than it is to uh, punish um, an innocent person. And so we deliberately in the legal system de deck the, uh, stack the deck in favor of innocence, right? We presume it. And then um, the accuser, uh, usually the state, has to reach a certain level, a fairly high threshold of evidence to be able to prosecute. I mean, that's in the ideal situation, obviously. There are lots of miscarriages of this principle all over the place, especially when it comes to people of color and immigrants and poor people. Um, but that principle, right, innocent until proven guilty, um, that's a legal principle. There's a separate question, sorry to sound too philosophical here. There's an epistemic question of just what you should believe, right? And what should we have believed about Harvey Weinstein, right, before the case was done, right? When you read just the credible testimony, credible, coherent, consistent testimony of dozens of women, right? Um, produced by a very careful investigation. Were we really supposed to just wait until the case was done? Absolutely not. The rational thing to do is to conclude that in all probability, he has um, he, he is guilty of various forms of sexual violation. That is distinct from the question of how to try someone, right? Um, so that move, that innocent until proven guilty move is only ever played in some cases, right? It's, it's a political move. It's not actually someone invoking a genuine principle. It's someone trying to shield uh, people from a certain class, a certain group from um, critical, skeptical scrutiny. Can't thank you enough uh, for your time today. Amia Srinvasan, professor of social and political theory at the University of Oxford and author of The Right to Sex, Feminism in the 21st Century. I'd encourage everybody to buy that book and check it out. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. It was great. All right, folks, with that, we are going to we have to take a quick break. We're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we will be join, joined uh, duh, by Melanie Dorigo, who is running for Congress in New York's 3rd District. Be right back. We are back and we are now joined by Melanie DeRigo, candidate for Congress in New York's third district, which is basically Nassau County, Long Island, uh, and a little bit of other parts, right? Am, am I right? 
Yes, historically it has been uh, part, you know, the North Shore of Long Island, Suffolk County, Nassau County, and also Northeastern Queens. Mm. Uh, right now we're waiting to see what the new district lines look like. All right. Well, yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, hopefully it doesn't change too much, right? How do you how do you campaign if you're not sure what your district is going to be? Yeah, well, you know, look, we always knew this was going to be a redistricting year. So, you know, I'm an organizer. So we were very strategic and surgical about where we were doing our knocking and our voter outreach and where we were doing our visibility. Uh, when the initial lines were redrawn, uh, we were actually redistricted into a district that had five counties, uh, part of the Bronx and Westchester, a little bit of the, the coast of Westchester up to the Connecticut border. So that was a little bit tricky to, um, you know, travel around and get to know all these new voters. But those maps, are, you know, have been thrown out by the courts due to extreme gerrymandering. And now, um, you know, we're awaiting our new maps. So we're going to continue doing what we do best. And that's just being really surgical and strategic about our voter outreach. Awesome. Well, I, I, I should say uh, Melanie is a progressive candidate, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, uh, ending corruption, cutting military budgets, all the good stuff. Um, and you have run in this district before um, because it used to be represented by Tom Swazi, who is now running for governor in what I perceive as an ill-fated choice. Um, but who knows? How, how did that open things up for you? I mean, there's a lot of candidates in your primary, but you've run in this district before. Um, do you feel like you kind of have a leg up given the fact that you uh, it's such a crowded field and you've 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 run before? Absolutely. And I will say to the viewers, you know, this is what progressive power looks like. We terrified this corporate incumbent and scared him out of the race. So he was too <laughs> afraid to face us again, uh, which, of course, opened up this primary. Uh, look, you know, there are a lot of folks that see primaries, especially establishment folks. They see it as their opportunity or what they're entitled to. Um, and, you know, look, I love a good primary. I think it really fosters democracy. It allows us to expand the electorate, bring more folks in. Um, but look, I'm the only candidate in this race that is running for true change. And, uh, you know, we've got the receipts to prove it. So we're feeling that we're in a very good position to win. Uh, last, last cycle, you know, obviously the pandemic hit. We couldn't have foreseen that. Even being outspent nearly 10 to 1 with the inability to knock doors, we got nearly 30 percent of the vote. Uh, so we are back with a lot more name recognition, with a bigger, broader coalition of support. We've got the most endorsements in the race. We've got the most volunteers. We've got the most individual donations. Uh, and the response has been excellent. Uh, as we know, you know, voters are feeling really apathetic and uh, they're very frustrated right now. And I think if there was ever a time for real progressive leadership to take over, it is now. So your primary is on August 23rd, just so people know that. Um, mm -hmm. This is a unique district. Uh, North Shore, Long Island has a lot of a lot of money there. Um, it's uh, pretty sure I'm pretty sure Sean Hannity lives there. Just like uh, that's that's <laughs> somebody who I'm just like c coming to mind. It's a suburb of New York, um, but Long Island sometimes trends more conservative than other suburbs of New York in you know northern New Jersey, other Westchester County, things like that. That's that's the perception. But you also have parts of Queens there, right? Um, what, what's unique about running in this district as a progressive with all these policy proposals that we as a progressive show agree with? How do you tailor that and how do you talk to people? What does the response say if you're in Huntington, New York versus if you're in the uh, uh, campaigning in Queens? Um, is it a fairly universal response? Uh, because let's face it, Swazi was able to maintain that seat largely because he, ha he cultivated uh, a large donor base of wealthy people in in that area, and th th they still exist. Yeah, so here's the thing about District 3. It certainly has, uh, it's one of the wealthiest districts in the country. It's also equally, uh, just, I think it's, it's the fifth wealthiest in the country and the sixth largest wealth inequality gap, just to give you, you know, that context. Uh, yes, Tom um, certainly did cultivate a, a, a long list of wealthy donors and a lot of lobbyist money. Unfortunately, we know that uh, lobbyists buy elections, right? Uh, and, and so do uh, big money networks. Uh, 
unfortunately, uh, we have seen that over and over and over. It's also hard to, as, as particularly as progressives, uh, many of us first time, even second time candidates, you know, we're going up not only against that money, but all, often considerable name recognition. So what is different about my district is that, uh, you know, certainly while Long Island is, and, and even this area of Queens, uh, historically has not been organized in the sense that, um, you know, door knocking and real true voter outreach and relational organizing has largely been missing up until very recently. Uh, so what we're finding is it doesn't much matter if we're knocking in Huntington, we're knocking in Port Washington, we're knocking in Belrose, Queens. It doesn't much matter because we have found uh, that educating voters and really making it as accessible as possible for them to plug in uh, is really a winning method. And I think that um, that is really going to be crucial in this particular race. So for, for the viewers who may not know, my primary was supposed to be June 28th, but because they threw out the lines, our primary, just congressional and Senate, um, state Senate races are moved to August 23rd. Uh, this means that voter turnout is going to be severely depressed, right? It's, it's, that always happens when an election is moved. It's also the last week of summer when a lot of families are away. Uh, so that, I believe, is an incredible opportunity for progressives to step up to organize and really take back uh, the power that we know our communities deserve and that our communities need. Uh, for me, I have never moderated my message. I believe if I walk into a tough room that, uh, you know, I may not believe is a Medicare for all room. Maybe it's not a we need to cut the military budget kind of room. That doesn't mean I change my message. It means I work harder. I educate harder. I come with the facts and we meet people where they are. And that has been a winning recipe for success. And that is why I know this district is ready uh, and, and excited about progressive leadership. So you're, you've worked as a healthcare advocate um, for a while and you mentioned Medicare for all. Well, I'll ask you a two-part question, if that's okay. One, how easy of a decision was it for you to support this kind of broad single-payer legislation? Um, and then I guess the second part is, as somebody who's who's uh, put that at the forefront of their campaign, what's your response to the awful news that's coming out of the Supreme Court and a as a woman's right to choose is being taken away? Yeah, so I I spent my career building preventive health strategies, you know, for families and patients and later organizations. So, you know, the bulk of my life has been in preventive health and I'm a mom of three. So supporting Medicare for all is a no brainer and was a no brainer. Uh, you know, interestingly, when I ran on a Medicare for all platform in 2019, some of my now opponents in the race told me that I, a candidate in this district could never win running on uh, Medicare for all. Fast forward to today, and now everyone's b borrowing pieces of my policy because it's a winning message. Now, a lot of things went into that, right? Firstly, uh, the grassroots in this district really have rallied and really beyond throughout Long Island and throughout New York have done extensive amount of outreach into communities, educating folks on how universal health care would impact their lives directly. Uh, and it makes sense to a lot of folks. Uh, and of course, the pandemic, you know, I think that really changed perception. So for me, running on Medicare for all, though, was uh, it was the easiest decision because I don't think as regular folks, you know, folks that, you know, I'm not someone that's connected politically. I'm not someone who's connected to immense wealth. Uh, I don't decide to run for Congress to do the wrong thing, right? We run for Congress as progressives because we know we desperately need change. Uh, so that means really fighting for all people, especially those on the margins. And anytime we find a policy that can uplift folks, that's the policy we're going to, you know, run with and really work to, uh, you know, to, to pass. Uh, regarding Roe and the leaked memo, I think, um, you know, it's an affront to women and non-binary people and trans men everywhere. Uh, it's, of course, you know, as a mother, as a woman, it is heartbreaking to see that, uh, you know, it's like we're looking in a window, right, a window into the future. Um I don't think that, you know, those of us who have been in the fight for reproductive justice are surprised at all about this leaked memo. Right. I think that's why so many of us went to D.C. to protest Kavanaugh. I was also there protesting uh, Coney Barrett, you know, because we could see this coming. Uh, you know, I we sprung into action right away once the leaked memo uh, came out. We had a rapid response rally. We brought people together in the community to rally hard. Uh, and I think this is going to be a real issue uh, in, in the upcoming elections. 100%.
Um, well, Melanie, where can people find more uh, about you and about your campaign? And if they're in Long Island or in the area, how can they help out? Absolutely. Uh, my website is Dorigo2022. That's D-A-R-R-I-G-O 2022.com. You can find me on Twitter at Dorigo Melanie or on Instagram or Facebook at Dorigo for Congress. Awesome. And this is New York's third district. So if you're on the North Shore of Long Island, it's likely that or Nassau County, parts of Queens, just check it out. Make sure you know which district you're in. You might be in New York uh, third Thank you so much, Melanie. I really appreciate your time today. And we Thank will put, you so much. Yeah, we will put uh, links to all that stuff in the description. All right, we're good. Yeah, Great. we got it. <laughs> all right, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, folks, with that said, we are going to wrap up the first hour of the show and head into the fun half. But first, Matt, what happened on Left Reckoning last night? Yeah, so uh, we had Nick Boll and a journalist from Colorado on to give us the background of the uh, Colorado Starbucks workers at the barn on Colfax Street in Denver, um, who unanimously on Tuesday voted to unionize. Uh, so we are going, we talked to him about like, all this shit that they had to put up with from management uh, harassing them uh, because um, all sorts of things that uh, come from not being paid enough in a city like Denver where rent is skyrocketing. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy uh, that we, we actually recorded the interview a little bit before um, the vote. So we weren't sure which way we weren't. I mean, we were confident which way the vote was going to go. But, you know, uh, it's hard to uh, predicting this stuff has been proven to me like I don't even try. Yeah, right. I don't even try to form an opinion, even if t someone tells me like it's going to go good. It's like, well, I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> um, but it happened. So um, sorry. Oh. OK. Oh, well, all right, but check it out. Uh, check out the Patreon. Check out patreon.com yes. slash left reckoning. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matt got Matt uh, dealing with some of the tech stuff. Um, yes, check out left reckoning. But we have Binder and Brandon. Look at that right away. Hello, guys. Hello. How are Hello. you? How's it going? It's going great. Great. Going well. What's happening on the discourse, Brandon, if anything at all? We will be recording either tonight or tomorrow. I have to admit, with uh, Mother's Day this weekend and Eurovision this week, it's been a little busy <laughs> on the, I, I don't want to say the B train, but it, yeah, a little bit, a little more busy on the B train. All the seats have been sold out. So we're going to get to recording tomorrow night in between Eurovision performances. Oh, good. All right. I'm glad you could squeeze that in. The uh, biggest uh, week of the year. For I know, Brandon, right? Brandon, we need Eurovision takes in the fun half. I need to know what you're what you're thinking. I, I'm always ready to, to chat about Eurovision. That's my. This is honestly a springboard to me getting into the lucrative market of Eurovision blogging. Yeah, like Brandon can talk about Eurovision, like Emma can talk about like hockey trades. <laughs> love Eurovision. Love musical theater. We could just go at reality television. Oh yeah, what a combo. They, they should make a make. What'd you say? We, a culture show. We need to do a culture show. Yeah. I mean, Brandon could do it by himself. I love uh, real culture. I, I like things that are like real, like authentic. Ancient aliens documentaries. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Binder, what's happening on your twin programs? Oh, it's a big week, as you could imagine. Big oh week. yeah, cryptos, <laughs> cryptos falling apart. That's very. This has all been leading to this. Moonbox yes, crash. Yes, it has. Uh, so on Scam Economy, there was an emergency episode that went up late last night with uh, Bennett Tomlin of Crypto Critics Corner, and basically spoke with him, and we broke down, and he explained what Luna is, what Terra is, why. The failure of these two tokens, these two coins, have led to this huge crypto crash. We, we break down it all. If you're looking for an explainer, the explainer on what's going on this week in the crypto world, this will be the one to inform you about it all. Check it out, scameconomy.com. It's up right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. And then the video version will be going up tonight, as usual, at 9 p.m. each time at youtube.com slash Matt Binder. And then on Doomed on Tuesday, I had Nandani Jami of checkmyads.org, and she basically explained to me about the ad tech companies that you've probably never heard of that, number one, 
help fund some of the worst people on the internet, far right extremist reactionary movements, sites like the post millennial and human events. <laughs> um, and also B, how these ad tech companies collect data on you and how that data could possibly potentially be used in a post row America. It's a fantastic episode. Check it out, doomedcast.com for that show. And also the video for that's also available right now at youtube.com slash Matt Binder. And also one more thing I got to drop. Sorry to uh, take so much time promoting. It's all good. But uh, this one will be worth it, I promise you. This Monday... I will be on the Tim Pool show. Whoa. There we go. Been uh, on the Tim Cat. Oh wait, has it yes. been has it been recorded yet? We were not allowed to say a thing about. I thought no, that no, was... it's uh, it's it's. I'm going there. It's live. It's live. Oh, it's um, live. Nice. Yeah, they're they're sending me to the uh, Tim Pool compound. Because I was expenses. gonna say, like, if it's not live, you should bring <laughs> you should bring your own recording device. Right, it's live. I'm not worried about that. It is live. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to, I don't know, screen record the live version, I don't, you know, I don't think anything will happen, but, um, if anyone wants to do that, feel free, but I'm not worried about that. I think that's fine. All right. Well, um, Sam would, Sam would tell you to do it. Sam would tell you yeah, to do luck, it. Bender. I know. Yeah. 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 Um, that'll be awesome. I can't wait and send us like, well, we'll definitely be talking about it next Thursday, but, um, hopefully even before then, I'm sure Sam will want to get into it as well. All right, folks, we are going to head into the fun half. Take your calls. Read your IM, 646-257-3920. And remember the, the new link in the in the chat yes. description. I mean, in the chat show description. Or show. I spam the chat with yeah, it. Yeah, so. fun half. It's a separate stream, new folks. Links. Go there. See you in a little bit. Bye-bye. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, Mickey. You did it. Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women. Stop. Talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight. Yes. Hi, me? Is it? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello? Is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go throw up. Who libertarians? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge met. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35501 1 half. 3 Nine eleven, for instance. Thirty-four hundred dollars, nineteen hundred dollars, five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, Sundown Guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. People the, the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, Look, um, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Uh, um, Two o'clock, we're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Uh, 
um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye bye. And one. We are back. We are back.